And welcome to Outside 50 Podcasts, produced by usfootynews.com. I'm Wayne Kraska. Unfortunately, Rick Shabani, my co-host, can't be with us today. He's out on assignment. But uh, I believe we have a fantastic show for you today. Um, as you've seen from the title of the podcast, it's called The Meeting Behind the Barn, virtually the beginning of the USAFL back in the mid to late 90s. I've had some very special guests on my uh, podcast today and um, none bigger than uh, Paul O'Keefe or Plugger as he's known to everyone. Uh, Plugger was the inaugural uh, president of the USAFL or USAFA as it was known then and uh, is considered to be the founder of the USAFL. Um, perhaps uh, these days he might be called the grandfather of the USAFL. Hey Plugger, how are you doing? G'day, mate, and uh, fantastic to be here and fantastic to live stories of 20 to 25 years ago now. It's amazing how time has flown. Sure, I totally agree there. Also on the call is uh, another person who was at that meeting behind the barn in the early days, um, seven times president of the USAFL and uh, took over from Plugger after his first year, two years as president, and that is Rich Mann, who's in... Denver, Colorado. Hey, Rich. Hey, thanks, Wayne. Thanks for having me, mate. And the third person we have on today uh, was given life membership of the USAFL in 2007 and was in those halcyon days in Cincinnati and Nashville, and that is Mikey Powers. Hey, Mikey. How you doing, Wayne? <laughs> Pretty good, Mikey. Pretty good. Well, guys, it's great to have you all on today and to be able to talk about these uh, the early times of the USAFL. Um, as I've seen, there's in two um, sorry in 1997 there were 15 games of uh, footy around uh, the US that were recorded, but uh, back before that there was probably a few few games leading up to that time before we actually got underway, and I wanted to talk a little bit about those. So. Um, Plugger and Rich, you were probably involved in some of those games through Cincinnati um, and maybe Chicago. Can you uh, explain how, when did you first uh, pull on the boots here in the US? Yeah, well, I'll probably go first. I remember at the time I was working in Kansas City. So this was in 90, uh, late 96, 97, and found out that there was a uh, starting up footy club. And there was a website at the time, the Maffle website, uh, that I was down as the uh, contact from Milwaukee somehow or other. So I'm like, well, that's the start of the, was the start of the web at the same time, which I think had a big bearing on the growth of the league early on. So I started to play with the Kansas City Club. Uh, that's what re really got me involved, even though I was living in Milwaukee. I remember two games that year that to me were critical in starting up the league. One was where we had uh, a game in St. Louis, and it was uh, sort of all the Midwest teams got together. It was sort of Kansas City, St. Louis. I think some of the Cincy guys were there. Uh, it was a crazy hot 100-degree day, if I remember. But it was after that game where a bunch of us sort of sat in the pub in the corner and said, you know, maybe there's something here and we should we should start to think about how we, uh, we formalize uh, – the league or formalize just what we're doing versus playing these one-off games. So I think that was a critical game. And Rich, I can't even remember, were you at that game by any chance? I was, yep. I definitely remember that heat, Plugger. Thanks for <laughs> reminding me of that. <laughs> I, uh, I don't think I held down fluid for about two hours after that game. And then my other earliest memory was actually an Australian high school kid, and he was charged with organizing some kind of a sporting event. And he was also based out of St. Louis. And he actually organized a game. I oh, was probably about an hour west of St. Louis at that time. And we just kind of got word through the grapevine that this pickup game was happening. And 
as opposed to the 100 degree heat of that St. Louis game, I think this game was played at about 25 degrees. So we were all freezing our butts off. And uh, but again, once that word went out, and like Plugger said, once the internet started to get a bit of a foothold, it was much easier to get a hold of people and, and organize those games. And back in those early days, it was definitely sort of since EKC, uh, Louisville, of course, played the very first game in 96 against Cincinnati at the end of 96. And then also back in those days, uh, Indianapolis had a team as well. They were the Indianapolis Swans in those days. So, so Rich, this was uh, late 95 or early 96, right? <laughs> Uh, would have been early '97, so it would have been winter. Yeah, oh, okay. I just moved. To, I just moved to Cincinnati at the start of '97. I was there in '96 um, on a bit of a job hunting um, sort of crusade at that time, and one of the guys said to me just randomly, "Oh, do you want to come for a kick of the footy?" And I honestly thought it was just going to be the two of us or three of us, and we rock up and there's 16 guys for training, and they go, oh, and the illustrious rich man has come all the way from Australia to take our training. So I was handed the footy and a whistle, and uh, yeah, since he was uh, was up and running, so yeah, it was uh, it was a it was a really sort of quick start at the, in back in those days for sure. So Mikey, uh, when was your first uh, time where you pulled on the boots? Or you, I know you heard about the game when you were. Uh, at college at UGA, um, but you were up in the Nashville, Cincinnati area? Yeah, what happened was uh, uh, originally uh, I had to, I was working in Nashville and there was some flooding around the Louisville area. So I had to head on up there to meet with the rail master of uh, uh, Louisville because our facility had been blocked off. And as we met on a Saturday morning, then I'm went to get some lunch and the guys from the Louisville football club were there and I recognized the jumpers and they said, Hey, have come and have a kick with us. And I was like, all right. So, uh, even though I didn't live in town, in fact, they didn't know I lived it. I didn't live in Louisville for about three months. Uh, I ended up having to kick with them. And then I didn't play in the original game with Louisville against Cincinnati, but I played in the next game, which was still in 96 up in Indianapolis where it was a combined Louisville, Indianapolis, and Cincinnati guys uh, playing. And uh, then, you know, I just kept going up to Louisville and practicing with the guys, and it just became too much of a, a drive, so tried to start the club in uh, Nashville. Yeah, that's pretty funny. I've heard that story before, Mikey. They didn't realize that you actually lived in Nashville all that time and were, were playing in Louisville, right? Yeah, I used to drive about 200 miles each way uh, just to, I'd stay with uh, either John Harrell or uh, Trevor Church once they figured it out. But a lot of the time I was just driving up and driving back. So it was a pretty good time. We just practice on Saturdays, but it was really a lot of fun. It was uh, enjoyable. The guys were pretty, pretty good. They were almost all Americans on the Louisville team. I don't think they had any Australians whatsoever. So this second game that happened in Cincinnati, I believe, so the yeah the second game was actually a game in Canada, and it was all the clubs got together and sent some representatives. Whoever wanted to go up, we played sort of a, a club team in Toronto. And I remember going up. Um, there was guys like Jim Hollywood from California, Jason from Kansas City. Sort of, I was from Milwaukee. Chucky and a few people uh, drove up from from New York and we ended up with about 20 plus guys, uh, mostly Aussies, sort of maybe 60% Aussies, 40% Yanks, just came to Canada for this sort of representative match. I call it the first unofficial uh, international match. It was actually that that match when we had a bit of a warm up on the Saturday before the game when we're doing some kick to kick and no one knew my name and I was a big lumbering full forward. And so, you know, the nickname plugger, but I think that game and the St. Louis game were the two things that made me realize that we were onto something. It wasn't just two guys, as Rich said, you know, two guys having a kick in the park. You know, if you got 20 guys flying across the U S to go play a game in Canada, there's something there about the energy and this St. Louis match where we all came together 
from across you know the Midwest to have this game in the middle of July with all this energy post match. They were the two things in '97 that made me think, "Wow, there's something here that you know we could build on," and that led to the nationals. Our first nationals were in Cincinnati, but I don't know. I don't know, Rich, if you could talk about how did that first nationals get organized? I think it was a Cincinnati sort of club that actually led that first sort of getting together. Yeah, so it's pretty much just myself and the founding Cincy boys, um, Jeff Can, who the MVP for the grand final is still named after for the Can medal. He was an Aussie over here as well. And then myself and a couple of other guys, uh, Reuben Gordon, Kevin Murray, and then, of course, the Louisville boys, so John Harrell and all those guys. So at that point, we just thought we had, a, like you said, Craig, we had 15-plus games that year spread across um, the Midwest, but there was also an LA team that was forming. Uh, we actually had a Toronto team come down for that Nationals. I believe it was five teams. So we just thought at that point, hey, let's just, you know, probably put in the cart before the horse at that point. But we thought, well, let's just, you know, start it off with a bit of a bang, call it the first nationals and we'll, you know, we'll go from there. So it ended up being a great, you know, two day uh, footy event. And uh, obviously that uh, led into that Saturday night meeting at the nationals, which um, obviously has become now known as the meeting behind the barn. Yeah, and it was classic because I remember driving out to the place where Cincinnati as the club had organized the banquet for that night. And it was in rural Indiana. And so there was a bit of a drive and then you got off the main highway and it was a bit bit sort of windy and then it was a dirt road and you're like, where are we going here? We're in deep Indiana, we're in the South. And then you sort of pop out and it was literally a pole barn. And it was one of the guys in the club who knew this guy. And he had basically set it up like a hunter's barn. You walked inside, there was a, a bar, there was, you know, dead animals all over the wall. It was sort of just that classic, iconic, you know, you could nearly hear the banjo in the background. <laughs> That's pretty funny. Um, from the records, I've dug out the, the names of the people who were at that. Um, at that meeting behind the barn, I'm sure there was quite a few. And I only always thought there was only like five or six of you, but um, there's a bit of a list. There's yourself, Plugger, Rich, uh, Mikey, obviously, Jeff Can, uh, Gary Flesher, Peter Bear, who I know very well from uh, Nashville, Jason Eustace, uh, Jim Cooper, James Campbell, Sam Ingram, and John Harrell. Um, they're the ones who've been listed in the archives of being at that meeting. Um, so can you maybe tell us a, a little bit about some of those uh, other people who were at the meeting and what was the meeting like? I, I guess it was alcohol involved, correct? <laughs> well, bit. I think let's talk about the people. I'll, I'll, I'll start with with Jason because Jason was part of uh, the Kansas City Club. And since I was playing in Kansas City, um, you, you know, I, I spent a lot of time with Jason and after every training ended up at, at his place and, uh, just a great, you know, good Aussie guy who just loved the sport and wanted to grow the sport. And I think he was reflective of sort of the spirit of people at that time. You know, it wasn't a bunch of button-down tie guys. It was a bunch of sort of country footy guys. I'm from Birken Hill. Richard's from Perth. You know, we weren't Melbourne-based big footy AFL guys. We were more love of the sport of Australian football guys. Uh, who else can you remember, Rich? Well, obviously, Jan, John Harrell was one of the key figures at that point. Um, you'd mentioned Jeff Kahn. Uh, John Harrell was actually a really well-known um, horse track um, journalist uh, based out of Louisville. Um, I actually went to a lot of uh, racetrack meets with him in Lexington, places like that. And just through the grapevine, for whatever reason, a bit like sort of Mikey probably just fell in love with the sport, you know, from a distance. And yeah, just happenstance, he and Jeff got in touch with each other and sort of thought, hey, do you want to just, you know, set up a game? So they kind of rounded up the troops and uh, that became that very first game down there in uh, Louisville in 96. And then, of course, now that um, unfortunately, sadly, John you know, passed away not too many years after that. Um, but we have uh, kept his name alive by naming the uh, 
you know, Division One Grand Final uh, trophy as the John Harrell Cup. So yeah, he was definitely one of the key figures in those early days for sure. Mikey, you were, uh, I've heard you talk about John Harrell a little bit before. Um, did you know him that well? Yeah, I knew him pretty well. I stayed at his house several times. You know, lovely wife, little daughter, that was adorable. Uh, uh, you know, he worked for the Thoroughbred Times and then he had uh, taken the job with the Louisville Journal uh, Courier uh, prior to a, his death. Uh, he, for those that didn't know, John had a, a massive brain hemorrhage. Uh, he had just been diagnosed with leukemia like two days prior. and He was actually at the hospital when this all happened. It was a pretty sad day. Uh, John was a wonderful guy, just a uh, full of life. Um, you know, at that meeting, the, John was one of the first people I met for the Louisville Club, him, Trevor Church, and Chris Parsley. I believe Chris was at that at the barn meeting as well. I know Marcus Drips with me from Louisville was there. Uh, and uh, do you remember who was there from the Los Angeles team? There was somebody there. It was Jim. It was Jim. Yeah, Jim Cooper. And then also there was another guy that, uh, I can't remember his nickname, but he did go on an infamous tractor ride with the farm owner. And we were wondering if we were going to get him back that night. <laughs> um, but he, uh, was Ruben there? he, he did come back. Uh, yeah, Ruben would have been there. So yeah, Ruben, Jeff, uh, Kevin Murray. Yep. Bunch of those early um, um, Cincinnati boys for sure. Yeah. Da there's a guy, Dan, that was one of our early coaches. He would have been there for quite a while as well. So, yeah. Absolutely, yes. So I remember, you know, we're eating in this barn with these dead animals on the wall having a beer. And uh, I sort of got Rich and Mikey together and said, hey, let, let's go and just sort of have a meeting. It was sort of too loud in the barn. So I said, hey, let's sort of go outside. Everyone that was eating, sort of the night was getting on a little bit. Everyone had had a few. Uh, so that's why it became the meeting behind the bar because of the barn. We actually went outside at the back of the barn. There was a small door. Um, and there was about, without memory all the people, my memory was there was about eight to nine people standing in a circle. So there was a, a lot of people at the event giving that. I think we had seven teams at that Nationals. Um, so that, that there was about eight or nine of us that, that walked outside, closed the door, there was one little sort of bare light overhead. We all had a drink, and that was sort of the, the kickstarter of the meeting behind the barn. And, you know, from memory, I kicked it off with basically saying, guys, I think we're onto something here. I think we've had a great tournament. If this is our first nationals, I think we need to think about forming some type of national body, some type of formal body. Uh, that can actually drive the sport for, forward because to that point it had all been very informal and ad hoc. And so that's what kicked off the discussion. Yeah, I remember that was, uh, remember him saying, hey, this is going to be, this could be big. So let's let's try to be a little bit more formal. So I gather there was no minutes taken from that meeting. Is that right? <laughs> no. Uh, that, this, these are the minutes of the meeting <laughs> right now, Brad. This is it. This is as good as it gets. That's too funny. That's too funny. Um, so being the, maybe the first to talk at that meeting, they duly erect, elected you uh, president of the new um, USAFA, as it was called. Well, at the time, I actually remember saying that um, I didn't want to be president. And, <laughs> um, you know, I, I didn't want it to be about a single person. I wanted it sort of to be a, a group led. And so I, since it was the first meeting, I said, I will be sort of the facilitator and I will state the start and I will start to drive it. And it was actually about three to six months later during that year where I said, okay, well, I'm, I'm literally the president. Um, and so I took sort of the interim president role until we had our first formal elections the following year. Um, because it was so informal at the back of the barn, we didn't, you know, we didn't take a vote. We didn't literally take uh, true positions. I sort of took the lead. And then the other thing is we called it the USAFA, the United States Australian Football Association. And we, we did that purposely was because at that point, we had no affiliation with the AFL. We had no funding from the AFL. 
you know, this was about the sport of Australian football, not a sort of a sidebar or a wing or a, you know, a division of the AFL. So that was the other reason we called it the USAFA to start with, just because we wanted to make sure we were seeing a very amateur and independent body as we got started. And why did we ever change that? Was it due to like the Air Force having some claim on it? No, I think that, so I, the other thing I remember early on was calling it US footy as our nickname because USAFA was a sort of a mouthful. So we went with the concept of US footy, partly, you know, as an Australian, we nicknamed it footy, partly we wanted to tie that link back to Australia with the with the footy portion. So it was over time when it became, you know, clear that when we got the funding and the relationship with the USAFL, that it made more sense sort of globally to be the USAFL. Uh, and that occurred sometimes over the first sort of, uh, the first four or five years as we, when we changed the name to USAFL and it was about, you know, 15 years later that we got rid of the US footy name as we became so much stronger from a US perspective. So Plugger, in 1998, I have a document in, in front of me that tells me that you are the president Mikey Powers was the secretary. Elizabeth Ballar was the treasurer. And Rich Mann, you were the VP of the East, the Central and the West. Yeah, so back in that day, I just thought I'd do the work of three people. That's <laughs> 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 what you do in the early days, Chris. <laughs> okay, so I saw on the uh, I saw on the sheets I have in front of me that um, we went from 15 games um, recorded in 97 to 118 games in 99. Um, that's a, a fairly um, quick growth spurt from uh, anyone's standpoint. Yeah, it was absolutely amazing to me how things just blew up in that first uh, that first year and a half. Uh, when we came out of the barn, we had a little bit of structure in place. We started to put together a constitution, and most importantly, we put together a website. And it was a small website back in those days. Uh, that first three months, I got probably 20 to 30 emails from folks across the country saying, hey, I want to start a team. And I think there was this really pent up demand for guys from Australia who would go out and have a kick, but they wouldn't organize a team because they had no one to play. But all of a sudden, if you were 10 guys in Boston, you could play New York. Or if you're in Chicago, you've got all these teams in the Midwest. And, if you're in San Fran, you could play, you know, L.A. or Orange County. And so we went from sort of that initial four or five founding clubs to 20 clubs, 25 clubs within the first two years. And then the number of games just blew up. And I think it was just the timing of the structure of the league plus the timing of the web just worked so well together. And that was just such an impetus to our growth and how we blew up. Yeah, and I think the big strength with that too, like I mentioned, was just the proximity of all those teams through the Midwest. You know, we could all drive to each other. The first three teams, Cincy, Louisville, Indy, were only an hour from each other. So it was very easy to get guys to just drive, come and play a game. We had very different levels of development and number of Aussies, things like that. And I think one of the big strengths back in those early days was just guys jumping in on other teams. I mean, as far as Cincinnati went, we won that first Nationals and we often could have beaten Louisville by 10 goals if we had have wanted to, but I would deliberately drag myself and our better Aussies over to the Louisville team, help our Cincinnati guys tag us, and that would actually help them. But it also meant that we weren't just you know, rubbing these guys' noses in it. And I think that camaraderie and friendship back in the early days helped a lot. I, unlike Australia, where obviously we get really competitive and it's a matter of if you're going to beat a team by 15 goals, you try to beat them by 20. Whereas we were never of that mindset back in those early days. And I think that was a big strength. I would agree because uh, like I uh, would tell people, a lot of teams didn't really understand how to play the game. And to have players like Rich and uh, Ruben and uh, even Paul come over and play for your team and give you some pointers really helped out, you know, because like Louisville didn't have any Australians whatsoever, yet we fielded a team. Now, we didn't play very well to begin with, 
but with their assistance, we got better over time. It was really the, one of the, the strengths of the league was that the Aussies were willing to help the Americans learn the game. And that was really important because it's an enjoyable game. And once the Americans got used to it, we could kind of spread the gospel as well. And also too, Crazy like you were saying about that high volume of games, a lot of that came down to two-day tournaments. We would all drive to Kansas City or St. Louis or whatever, and you know, we'd all play you know, four or five games per day. And I still remember playing in St. Louis one weekend and after losing to Denver four times in 24 hours. And I think I kicked the total sum of one goal one across those four games, which was those clubs' total score for that weekend. I finally decided to ask my missus at the time. I said, would you want to move to Denver? And there was, funnily enough, talking camaraderie, there was an Aussie PT who was playing for Denver at the time. So I sidled up to him on the field mid-play and said, well, can you get me a job? He said, sure. So came off, um, proposed the idea. And, uh, yeah, next year I was in Denver and won the next Nationals. So, And that was the other strength as well because once we had enough clubs and we hit that tipping point, Guys knew if they moved to another city, we didn't lose them out of our system. They didn't leak out of the system. They went to another club. Or like Mikey, if there wasn't a club, you just go and form it yourself. That's when I knew that we were under something really great was when I would meet people coming out of school making career decisions based on moving to a city where there was a footy club. Like that was their first criteria. It didn't matter what club. It just, just had to have a footy club. And I'm like, okay, when people are starting to make career decisions around footy in 1999, we are really onto something. And these were all American kids too. This is one of the Aussies. This was the Americans saying, I want to make sure I live in a place with a footy club. Yeah, well, Mikey Powers is the only American on this uh, little chat. And Mikey started the team in Atlanta. Um, obviously had a, had a hand in the, in the starting of Nashville and Louisville. So, Mikey, I know you went to UGA down here in Georgia, but, um, you know, you were traveling backwards and forwards from Nashville at that time? Uh, in the middle of 98, I took a new job with Qualcomm, so I moved down to Atlanta, and that's when I started the team in Atlanta. So it was just some way to keep the game going. I enjoyed it. Okay, guys, so moving on to, you know, around uh, probably the year 2000, um, the, the Nationals have moved to Los Angeles. Um, and as Rich has already mentioned, that was the year that uh, the first year that Denver started to take control. I hope it's because of you were in the team, Rich, right? <laughs> well, I did leave for four years and they won all four years that I was gone. Oh, and there you go. We, <laughs> we, we lost the we one in 2000, of course. Um, and that was six games in two days. I don't think I've ever been more exhausted and drained in my entire life um, at that uh, Sunday night in uh, LA. But uh, yeah, the boys do make fun of me, the fact that we lost in 2001 and then they won four in a row. I came back in 06 and then we lost again. So <laughs> I uh, <laughs> I may not have been a good commandant at that point, but, uh, but yeah, no, it was, it was, I was very keen at that point to start moving nationals around the country. I mean, it kind of, landed in my lap by default in Cincinnati and those second and third years sort of no one else really kind of wanted to take on that headache and that stress so we kept it there but then as soon as I moved to Denver um, and then stepping up to become president at that point I said to the league I said hey let's you know let's start look at moving it you know around the country and spreading it you know spreading it from coast to coast and that was why we ended up in LA. Right and um, from there we went to uh, Washington DC for a uh, 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 nationals there. Let's go back a little bit. To get the I'm big on facilities and fields and things like that. What were the sort of conditions that we were playing under in games in, in the early days in Cincinnati as well? But at the nationals for those games, did we have some challenges with, with field set up and things like that? Oh, definitely. You know, I, I patted myself on the back and by the third nationals, when we actually um, convinced our local city to remove two permanent cemented in, you know, sets of soccer goalposts. And that was a, that was a highlight <laughs> for us at that point uh, because we, at that point we needed two fields, you know, cause the first two nationals, we only, we just played on the one field and it was just a local yeah soccer park up in Fairfield. 
Uh, we moved out to LA. Uh, that was a real challenge. It was almost a, a dirt patch at that point. Um, so they were some pretty tough fields and conditions to play on. I still have the scars on my legs from that one. And then uh, DC, we actually ended up at the infield of a horse racetrack. I think it was, uh, I don't know if it was a trotting racetrack or a, uh, actually um, the, the gallops, but um, but yeah, that ended up on the interior there. But it's it's always been an ongoing issue, but I think these last few venues we've had, San Diego, obviously Sarasota, Florida are amazing. And then by the looks of it and the sounds of it, these next California fields are going to be um, yeah, pretty five-star as well. So we've we've come a long way from ripping our skin and sticking to the bed sheets at night. <laughs> yeah, I think the one thing with nationals that became clear is that we actually had a product to sell to cities. Those first couple of years, it was just trying to get a park and rec to give you the location and give you, you know, the insurance was one of the reasons that we did the first year was under the league was get insurance so that everyone had insurance, but just to convince people that we weren't going to destroy their field was a, was a big deal. And then all of a sudden um, it became a million dollar event. And that, that sort of turned in about 2004, 2005, and 2005 was the last year that a club ran the Nationals in Milwaukee. And after that, the league took it over. And we could actually go to cities and bid it out. And those mid-sized cities actually love us. Like Sarasota uh, loves us. Uh, you know, uh, when we did a couple in Ohio, they love us because we're a big event to those cities and they look after us really well. And that sort of turned the quarter in finding locations and actually putting on a really successful nationals. Yeah, I remember the uh, my first two nationals, by the way, were the two Kansas City nationals. And um, at that time, we never had a facility that had three fields in the one location. And uh, I remember the Kansas City fields, uh, 2003 especially, the grass was like about seven inches long and, and pretty wet. And, uh, and the funny thing about that, um, that Nationals, I think it was that one or the one before the, in Kansas City, and speaking to Martin Coventry on a podcast the other night, he reminded me that the, uh, the USAFL that had ranged for or the city uh, transport back to the hotels in uh, prison buses, uh, which was pretty hilarious. So, uh, and there was a bit of, a bit of beer thrown uh, around those buses, I can tell you, on the way back to the hotel. <laughs> That was true. But that's what makes <laughs> some of this chat and some of those days uh, so enjoyable when you remember that and be reminded of those sorts of things. But we've certainly come a long way now, certainly on our fields um, from from those old days. But uh, yeah, and um, we have to remind people that uh, although um, we have guys that have been here a long time, they've not only uh, been supporting the game um off the field but they've supported it on and two of my guests plugger and mikey have held the record of attending every usafl national championship which i think will run into about 23 this year and uh, i remember at the previous nationals a couple of years ago they have uh, joked before together about are oh, you here again uh, <laughs> and how how long is it going to go guys before one of you can't make it as soon as i realized that we we're on a on a on such a great streak i decided that i have to pull on the boots every year now forever until they wheel me out in the wheelchair and it was hilarious last year mikey <laughs> why we're on the same team and i got the ball and Hand passed it to Mickey as he went through and kicked, and I said, "There you go, legend to legend." It was a, uh, it was a great play to be on the same field and <laughs> and get a stat. So it's been a lot of fun. <laughs> it's been a lot of fun. I think that was my only kick all weekend. Well, you're not only uh, <laughs> two of these guys, and not only legends. You're also in the Hall of Fame, Plugger and Rich. Um, uh, Plugger, you were inducted in 2007 as the first uh, person in the Hall of Fame, and Rich. Uh, in 2012, and there's been a couple of others as well since then. Uh, Catherine Hogg is one that comes to mind, um, and um, Dennis Ryan as, as well, who um, uh, hasn't been uh, with the USAFL for a couple of years. But, um, you know, I think that's important that you see, um, 
signify some of the people who who really um, do all the hard yards. And and well, I think we all know as uh, early uh, exponents of this game that we've worked thousands and thousands of, of hours without uh, any monetary award just for the passion of the game. Yeah, we thought it was really early in those early days that we have life membership, which is a very Australian thing. And we have the Hall of Fame, which is a very American thing. And so you have to become a life member before you can enter the Hall of Fame because we wanted to be able to recognize, you know, a lot of people for a lot of different reasons. And, you know, as a league, it's it's administrators, it's umpires, it's even supporters, coaches that we wanted to be able to recognize everyone through the life membership. Um, and then also have sort of the Hall of Fame uh, as that, you know, people that have spent a real lot of time. So it was real, you know, an honor for me to be to be the first one and to get that started. And I think it was that year in 2007 that we we actually kickstarted. It was our 10th anniversary, the life membership and the Hall of Fame structure to recognize people. Yeah, that was fantastic. I remember those awards being given out and I was so proud of Mikey because I was connected with uh, Atlanta to... Uh, um, to get life membership in 2007, which was the 10 year anniversary as well. So uh, after 2001, Rich, you, you've done two years there as president. We had, then had 2002 with John Lonacek was president, um, and Chris Adams, who's a good friend of mine, was uh, was secretary. And 2003, Mark Wheeler, and 2004, and um, I remember uh, I was tournament director of 2004 of the Atlanta National Championships. And uh, Mark was president for three years. And then uh, Rob Oliver from New York, who stepped into six and seven. And then, Rich, you, you returned to the, uh, the fire pit there. You came back as president later on uh, for your second stint. What, what, what changes did you see straight away when you came back as president after a, a five or six year ab absence? Well, first of all, I'm a sucker for punishment for wanting to come back in. <laughs> I remember I was actually still back in Australia. And at that point, we had sort of a loose international um, sort of committee forum sort of based out of Australia. Um, so we had some guys like Tony and other people you know, that had either been here or were affiliated with us. So we had like a loose Australian um, sort of representation that would talk to the AFL and umpires and those sorts of things. So I was on that committee. I'd been on an international AFL committee that had organised the first um, AFL International Cup. So I had already been talking to the board and I sort of said, hey, look, I'm coming back at the end of 06. I'm more than happy to put my hand up and take nationals, you know, straight back ahead of time. So they handballed me that sort of straight away very gleefully and then probably said you're hot when the ball was in the air and then uh, was, uh, especially after those LA Nationals talking field challenges for those that were at LA we had some issues there for sure so as soon as I'd stepped back in that fold I said okay look oh, this is my baby I started it I'd run five up until that point so I wanted to take Nationals back and then pretty quickly, I was once I was back on the national board, I was more than happy to step back up and, and be president. I think the big difference at that point was not only the development and the professionalism of all the clubs um, and their formation, but with that came that downside of clubs, you know, that Australian anti-authoritarianism of, let me say that again, the typical Australian anti-authority authoritarian authority authority yeah anti-authoritary anti attitude and uh but, but that was definitely an issue like i said because there were a lot of clubs that were doing very well in their own right you know making money doing their own thing and a lot of them started to kind of look at the league and say hey well you know what have you done for me lately? Which is, yeah, definitely an Aussie kind of an attitude. So that was definitely something that I had to do a lot of work with and sort of say, hey, look guys, look at where we've come from, look at where we are, look at what we can become. But if we become one of those organizations that splinters, we're gonna be in big trouble, you know, really quick. And thankfully we were able to keep everyone, you know, on the same track and, and moving forward. You obviously always have your your issues and your um, 
you know, sort of fractures in between. But uh, I think we uh, did a really good job and especially it goes to the founding members like myself and Mikey and Plugger and those guys that have been here since day one to kind of reel those teams in and, and just kind of have a bit of a heart to heart and uh, bring them back together. But uh, definitely the commercialism and the money. When we went to Austin, um, that was another watershed moment when we were able to go to the state of Texas. They have a sports grant. And through that, yeah, we were able to fund not only that nationals and everything with those fields, but also put some money in the coffers and, and sort of set us up for the next 10 years. So those sorts of funding and working with all the national sports organisations was definitely a big step forward that I saw that we didn't have when I left in 01. Yeah, I would say, Kraz, one of our strengths as an organisation has been the board over the years. And, you know, I, I stepped down after two years and Rich took over because we wanted to make sure from the very beginning that there was always a good succession plan for the board. This is a hard job to run, at, you know, any sporting, amateur sporting body. It takes a lot of time and effort. And it can't be about one person. You know, I, I really didn't want to be the plugger league. So, you know, it was great. Rich and I had been together from the beginning. Rich took over. I became the member at large. I was still very, you know, involved in the league for those, probably those first 10 years. But I think, you know, I look back here now 20 plus years later, we've had a good rotation of board members and presidents uh, because you need to bring in fresh energy uh, and fresh ideas. Uh, and to keep things moving. And I think we've already done a good job of that. It's been part of our strength over those first 20 years. Yeah, and I, I would even add to that, it, even though the league is really based at a grassroots level, it's that leadership that's helped us grow continuously now for 20, almost 25 years. It, even though the clubs start locally, it's some guidance that helps, really helps those teams grow and you know get involved with other teams so that makes a huge difference and i think part of the reason the league's been successful yeah we've certainly come a long way um you know back when we go back to 97 and 98 and hear those stories of um you know a couple of guys just rocking up for a kick and find that there's 10 or 15 now where we have teams here in the country that have uh are registering 100 players at a time and um and the facilities that we're getting for national championships are, are second to none. Um, uh, I don't believe that a lot of people maybe that are going around or uh, playing the game right now don't realise how primitive uh, things were back in those days. And it's not that long ago, although it seems like forever ago, 20 years. Um, it's not that long ago where where we were struggling for uh, basic, uh, basic things like, and especially for umpiring and officials and and things like that which has really taken off which has been great to see over the last couple of years with the USAFL um Mikey Powers I know has probably in his formative years at Atlanta probably umpired more games than he played and he played 120 games for the Atlanta club um but he he would uh drive to uh to Nashville with us or another city and any home game he would umpire, but he'd also umpire other games as well. And was probably one of the first ever um, US um, umpires who who did that. Um, well, American umpires that did that. But, um, you know, and those sorts of unselfish types of uh, acts of kindness, like Mikey could could have easily played every game for Atlanta and he'd, you know, he'd be still in front of me as a player, um, but, um, you know, he, he umpired all those games. And, uh, you know, that's where I think a lot of players these days um, still don't realise, and it's probably up to us as the veterans, as we don't like to be called, to uh, just to remind them where we've come from. Yeah, and I still remember I went to the very first organised AFL umpiring and coaching clinic that I ran out in California, um, Pete Hanlon and uh, one of the umpire directors came out. That was the first ever training session because, like you said, Chris, I very early on I saw that as a huge gap and hole in our league formation. It's back in Australia, everyone loves to bag the umpires, but where do the umpires come from? And we weren't going to get them from Americans and locals, and it's rare that you've got someone like Mikey that could step up and do that. So 
we did that clinic out there and then the next big clinic was actually up in Chicago and uh, that weekend after I'd run that uh, weekend uh, umpiring clinic, I actually gave the award for that weekend to a now very well-known Jeff Person, who was a bright-eyed, bushy-tailed, didn't know anything about Australian football, but just wanted to come out and umpire and referee and thought, you know, to be a bit of a lark. And I'm sure Mikey, you know, knew Jeff very well from the Nashville early days. And, you know, you look at Jeff now, and I mean, he's, you know, probably umpired more AFL, US AFL games than anyone. He's been to Australia. He's umpired in official international cup games on the MCG, which I was very jealous of. Gave out a yellow card, which yeah. is only Jeff can. <laughs> With a with a full beard. With a full beard, yeah. As he was being heckled by the entire <laughs> revolution group. So, um, yeah. but no, it is. It's, I think that's the other big thing as well because when you play for an Aussie footy club, the club's been there for a hundred years. the The goalposts have probably been in the ground for twenty. The field has been marked for twenty. So Aussies, when they get here, they don't know about having to get to the field two hours before you tournament or your game hey we have to physically mark the field and hammer in the goalposts and set up pvc and who's going to umpire and who's going to do this so i think that's definitely been a big big evolution of the game but i think we've done a great job and the usa umpires association obviously steve arnett came into the hall of fame and uh, he's been a, a very good strong leader to develop that and, and push that forward so we've, we've definitely done really well in a lot of those other areas as well uh, i remember when we got a two pieces of planks in the old days some some really big old tidy whities stapled them to the planks and they were the goal umpire <laughs> flags and i you know that's sort of that good australian uh, larrikinism that we brought to the game in the early days they were classics well being a tournament director of a nationals myself plugger i remember mark wheeler coming to me on the morning of the nationals in atlanta in 2004 and saying to me where are the goal umpires flags <laughs> uh, and i said uh i'm pretty sure wheels that was not on my job description <laughs> <laughs> so we found an old sheet in the back of the trailer that uh, the Atlanta club had at that time and we cut it up and we found some uh, small fence posts that you used to, um, you know, the silk fence posts that you'd mark with a little silk fence and we made some flags out of that for the first game before we figured something out. But I always want to remind Wheels that when I look back at the um, – at the organising document, um, it was the USAFL's responsibility to bring the, <laughs> to bring the umpires flag. So, and I'm, I'm hoping to get him on the podcast so I can remind him about that. There you go. <laughs> That'd be wonderful. So on the administration side of things as well, um, you know, we've moved now to a far more professional um, sort of organisation with some sponsorships and and uh, support uh, organisations. Back in the late 90s, what did we have to fund the organisation? Plugger. So it was interesting <laughs> that, yeah, <laughs> plugger. Well, that's partly true. Um, when we started in 97, that I was home in Australia that summer and actually set up a meeting with the AFL, um, met with the AFL senior guys who... Uh, gave us some initial funding to get us started. I also met with most of the AFL clubs in Melbourne and in Sydney and in Brisbane to help sponsor our clubs here, which is why we're, you know, the Chicago Swans, those type of names. Um, and then it was uh, tooth and nail. I actually did fund the league for about three or four years uh, when we had uh, some, some challenges. You know, it it was uh, by the, the thin of our teeth to, to make things work. Was that a simple IOU? Yes, it was. It took about 15 years to get the IOU back. <laughs> uh, it was an ongoing joke but, of the board retreat of when does Plugger actually get his money back. But uh, we, yes, we, we, yes. we did end up getting it back to him. And, and the other one I, I would call out too is we were so close to not holding nationals in California because of cost. And I met with Glenn Cooper in Chicago and uh, personally when he was on a trip and said, hey, we want you to sponsor us. And, uh, you know, real Aussie beer, real Aussie footy. 
uh, and they chipped in and have sponsored us ever since. And I still remind them every year of how not just critical their partnership is today, but without them taking a bit of a punt on us, we probably would have had to cancel um, nationals that year in California because we didn't have enough money for the field. So, you know, it's like any startup, right? There's always an element of, of, of money. It's also an element of cash flow, a little bit of angel investors, um, you know, to, to get us through. And I'm glad we're in a pretty good, uh, standing today. I think we're uh, probably not where we want to be uh, yet because if we had one bad nationals, you know, you look at the coronavirus thing now, if we had to, to cancel nationals, that would uh, nearly bankrupt us. So we're not quite where we need to be yet, but it's so much different than it was in the early years where it was, you know, you make anything work just to get a game on. That. Uh, brings up an interesting topic uh, for everyone. If looking back through your those formative years, you know what would be one thing that you you maybe wish you'd thought of earlier, or you maybe should have done that. You, you know, I'm not talking about regrets so much, but uh, you know, it, uh, is there something that you would have started earlier that you started later? Well, I, I've got two. What you guys think? One. One is a success story that we don't do anymore, which I'd like to see us come back, which was the admin meeting where we brought all the club admin people together at the start of the season. I think we did the first one in Cincinnati in 99, where we actually formulated the constitution and the structure. If we had not done that meeting, I don't know if we would have survived the way that we did because it, it got us to think from an administrative point of view, not a competitive point of view. And you know, a lot of got a lot of things out on the table and got a lot of people together. We did that for two years. I think we did one in Phoenix. I would like to see that come back because I think that was critical. The other thing that we did early on that, you know, we went initially with a club based fee structure, not an individual based fee structure. Uh, I always wanted an individual based fee structure because I believe that the USAFL as the league has to have a relationship with the player. It can't just be with the club because otherwise no one knows what the USAFL does for them. Um, I felt strongly about that at the time and I still think I'd like to see us have a tighter relationship uh, between the player and the league. Clubs are still obviously critical. But I think, you know, the guy that turns up that has a kick has to know that there's this structure behind them that actually makes this work. So there are two things that sort of come to my mind from the early days. Yeah, and from my point of view, I just think probably looking back, we probably needed to formalise and control a little bit more about the USAFL club to AFL club relationships. We didn't we probably weren't strong enough on controlling those uh, contacts and phone calls. We would go to an AFL club and then say, well, we've already sent three sets of jumpers to Joe Blow in, you know, Northwest, you know, Pacific, and we never heard back from him. So we probably should have controlled those relationships a little better and made them look a little bit more professional. Cause I think the main problem was with a lot of those AFL clubs, it was one guy calling up from South Dakota and they just blindly sent over a set of jumpers. And then that, to a certain degree, with some of our AFL clubs almost ruined you know, some of those relationships. So I think with us via the AFL and then down to the AFL clubs, we, we definitely could have controlled that better. I, I would agree with that, Rich. I certainly remember a communication that... Um, the USAFL clubs were not to contact AFL clubs, but somewhere down the path, that seems to have been thrown out the door. Yeah, no, I, I concur. And I think with naming, branding, you know, those sorts of things, I think, again, I think, you know, we, as a, as a national league and a governing body, I think even after signing that constitution, clubs are actually sort of, binded to that relationship where they need to come through us to approve naming rights, you know, who are you going to call your club, jumper design, things like that. And uh, yeah, no, I, I agree, Kraz. I think uh, a couple of those things have kind of, you know, slipped by the wayside when you have a second Dockers team, for example, um, which, you know, from 
the fact that we the original club were the Cincinnati Dockers, um, and now we have another one. Um, I mean, there's plenty of names out there, so I think we definitely need to tighten up some of those controls. Yeah, fair enough. Um, we're not uh, <clears throat> going to get into the politics of football no. too much. <laughs> we just did, but <laughs> we can delete. Um, we can delete that if you want, mate. No. <laughs> Uh, well, guys, um, if you'd like to wind up, unless there's anything else you'd like to talk about. I would just like to say, Kraz, thanks for doing this. This is fantastic. You know, I think it was great that Doc wrote the book years ago to sort of try and capture some of those stories. I think we have, you know, hundreds of little stories that uh, we need to sort of remember. It's also fantastic, you know, for me just to sit here and think about the old days. I've been thinking about all weekend, just sort of the different things that what can I remember, what can't I remember? And I think, you know, within human nature, I, I honestly pretty much only remember the really good things, the great stories. And honestly, at Nationals every year at some point, when I look around and see all these games going on and 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 particularly the, the women's league and the strength of the men's league, at some point, I always have a tear in my eye just thinking back to those first telecom days and how far we've come and, and just how special uh, it is. And uh, there's a famous quote of a guy once said to me, Plugger, I love footy. That's pretty cool. Hey, before we go, those guys, I'm sure you've, like uh, Plugger said, you've been thinking about what you're going to talk about today, but I'm sure you have in your mind one of the most amusing um, incidents from any club that you've been involved with. And I have a feeling I know what Mikey Powers might be, but um, what is one of the funniest things you've ever seen happen on a field or off the field or at an after game party that uh, you can tell our listeners about without us getting into too much trouble? Yeah. Well, that getting in trouble part might be a problem. Uh, the, uh, the, the one thing I kind of remember is we played a, the tournament in uh, Washington, DC and we had a, a gentleman that played for our team. And I think Kraz rem might remember him. He's the one that's been arrested from fraud eventually. Uh, that uh, he uh, he was quite different. Even as we were kicking the football around, waiting for the rental vans, he kicked it on the roof of the, the rental van company. And uh, at that DC tournament, I believe they videotaped all the games. And I remember one game where he went to kick the ball off the ground and he missed, and then he tried to kick it with his other leg, and he landed on his back and head, and we'd forgotten all about it, but then when the video came out, I think it just raised the roof when everybody saw it. It was like, oh, yeah, we forgot about that, and it, it was just something odd that we all watched the game later that now that we remember and see things that this gentleman had done, it was a little bit different. Rich, you don't want to tell us a little bit about some of the Denver after parties, do you? Uh, we've got a couple. We have what we call the Clanger Award. So if you've done the most uh, stupid, uh, asinine thing of the weekend, um, <laughs> you get the Clanger Award on the Sunday night. And uh, it can be anything from missing a plane flight to ending up in the wrong city, doing it on the wrong day. Uh, we've had guys go out with the women to lead them in the club chant and then forget the song or forget the words. So there's been a, been a few of those. Um, we also used to do a informal clangor award at the end of nationals. So like people like myself and Plugger and Suze Graham, who was a just an absolute trooper, used to do so much hours and, and work with me. And I know um, you all know her really well. And really well. So yeah. Sunday night really well. after a few Frosties, we'd always sit around and, sort of come up with the most idiotic comment that had been passed over the weekend towards us, especially as organisers who had had no sleep. And one of the best ones I had, I was umpiring, talking umpiring, I was umpiring an 8am game in Louisville, knowing that I had probably, you know, four games ahead of me to play and president and national tournament director and the whole bit. So last thing I wanted to be doing was umpiring as well. And I've handed out two goal umpire cards to two guys, put them in their jackets, talking go on by flags, Kraz, we had nice USAFL logo <laughs> flag, sent them down to their, you know, respective uh, goal squares and given them their pens and their little clipboards and the whole bit. And half time they've come back in and I said, hey, is the score on the scoreboard correct? And 
they both conferred and said, yep, that's correct. They said, yep, great. Okay, go back out. And then at the end of the game, they come back in and one guy gives me his goal score card and he's got everything filled out correctly and gives me the card. And then the other guy gives me his card and it's completely blank. And he looks at me as, well, you wanted me to fill that out. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, um, yeah, it's kind of why I gave it to you. It's, uh, <laughs> you know, that's instructions there, Rich. Well, I don't know who's to blame there. <laughs> I, I thought I was pretty clear with my instructions at that point. So, but yeah, just, just wrapping up, like Plugger said, I've, I've definitely been, yeah, retrospective and, and looking back on everything we've kind of been through and, Definitely never thought that that meeting we had out the back of the barn and going for a kick of the footy would have, you know, become what it has become as a league and not only the camaraderie, but definitely, the, you know, the professionalism and the commercialism that it's become. And obviously we're now, you know, one of, if not the biggest international leagues in the world. And I think we still hold the bragging rights to the biggest, you know, Aussie footy tournament in the world as well, which I think is, uh, is no small feat. And, uh, I've missed four nationals and yes, I'm sorry that yeah, Denver won all four of those and I'm four behind Plugger and Mikey. So I just have to wait for these two to stop playing and wheeling themselves out onto the oval. And then I've got four more to go to catch up. So, <laughs> and I'll, I'll be doing my- But you've never missed an after party. I've never missed an after party yet. So, um, but I also, <laughs> I also must say that, you know, yeah, my wife and in life, you know, nationals is it's on the calendar now. It's in cement. That's just something we do as a family. My son's now he's he'll be seven this year. I think he's been to five nationals, and so he'll probably start catching up to me pretty quick. And uh, I always say that when I get two nationals, there's only a few handful of people that I always make sure that I'm going to catch up with, and three of them are definitely on this phone call. So I just want to thank all the. Lifelong friends I've made, and um, yeah, and here's to another 25. Cheers. So, uh, yeah, I must say, at Nationals, Rich, when you talk about your son, it is fantastic when, you know, my kids were there and had their umpires every year, and one year she was selected to uh, goal umpire the, the men's grand final on her merit, which was absolutely fantastic, and I was standing next to Nick Rewalt in the middle uh, for the ceremony before the game for the Amphers and walked off and had a tear in my eye and said, you know, Nick, it may not mean a lot to you, mate, you know, looking up at Nick, but, you know, just brilliant when, you, you know, your kid's about to take the field. So I think when it comes around generations, you know, we've also now at an extra level of our growth. And I got one good story for you, Kraz. Our first international match in Chicago when Paul Roos was our coach, uh, Canada came down, we're in Chicago and, you know, we're in warm-ups and Paul calls the players in and they all run in clapping and they clap harder and harder until they get to him and then he stares at something and they go out back for a drill and he calls them back in and they all start clapping as they all run in, sort of very sort of American football. And at one point he turns and he says, Plugger, what's with all the bloody clapping? Because <laughs> uh, he had no idea what it meant. I'm like, just go with it, Paul. It's all, it's all good. So... Um, that was, and that was Paul's first ever game that he coached. And he'll talk about that when he commentates the AFL, but that was his first ever coaching gig was the USA revolution for his first ever win. Yeah. Paul Ruse has been a great supporter of US footy for uh, quite some time. He's visited it uh, quite, quite much. And obviously, you know, our uh, podcast reaches back into Australia. Now we have a, a really good following from Australia. So and anyone is welcome to come over, not only the, the AFL players, but uh, if you want to spend a, a, a month or two over here in the US, um, look up where you might come and come and visit one of the uh, 45 teams here in the US and hang out and play a bit of footy or come to training or or lend your support in some other way. You know, there are many ways that uh, clubs over here, uh, we're all still amateur clubs, are, are looking for help. So. Thank you, gentlemen. It's been an absolutely honour to share a, a room or a screen with you, as I have today. Um, it's been fantastic, and I look forward to seeing you uh, maybe a couple of years uh, in uh, the coming months, or maybe at some of the regionals. And um, certainly, we'll be there in California, won't we? Won't we, guys? Definitely, we will be. Definitely. All right, guys. Thank you. Cheers. Thanks, See you, guys. guys. Take care. Thanks. Thanks. Take care, fellas. Outside 50 is brought to you with the help of Play Aussie USA. 
Play Aussie is the only place in the USA you can buy the famous Sharon football, a proud sponsor of the USAFL. Visit them at playaussie.com.